All right, I'm going to talk about performance optimizations you can do with Lucene 4. And this talk is more about what has Lucene 4 to offer for you to make your application run faster, deliver better results. It's not about which, which little screw you have to turn um, for, your, for solving your specific problem. So this, this um, just wouldn't fit in 45 minutes. So many specific problems here. Who am I? I'm a Lucene committer for a while now. I um, mainly work on the uh, Lucene core side of things, like index writing or uh, file formats and these kind of things. And I'm a co-founder of Berlin Buzzwords. I co-founded Elasticsearch, the company. So if you have Elasticsearch questions, you can also talk to me. But this talk is not about Elasticsearch, it's solely about Lucene. You can follow me on Twitter if you want, um, or write me emails to either one of those addresses, they're all going to reach me. All right. Um, for whom is this talk, right? If you're already an expert about Lucene 3 and you, you, you use this software for a while, this is probably the right thing if you want to migrate to, uh, to Lucene 4. If you're curious about what we can do better in Lucene 4 and um, what we changed and why we changed it, <laughs> sorry, I had to laugh at this guy up there, uh, um, um, then this talk is probably the right thing for you too. Um, if you're an information retrieval expert and you want to get more into um, uh, the features where we opened up APIs to try certain th things like different scoring models or integer compressions. This is probably also going to give you a lot of insight into what uh, Lucene 4 can offer for you. Well, anyway, um, so this point probably applies to everybody, right? Like every CPU count cycle counts, so we made a lot of improvements. And um, if you just want to know and are curious, that's the right thing for you too. The only thing, if you haven't heard about a term like index reader or index writer, then this talk is probably not the right thing for you. But we'll see. If you don't understand anything, you can, you can just interrupt me and ask the question right away. OK. So what is performance? Like When I, when I uh, proposed this, this title for this talk, I was like, not sure if, this, if I can actually make everybody happy. Because performance means so many different things, right? Like uh, better search quality, faster queries, less RAM, less disk usage, higher concurrency. Um, garbage collection matters to a lot of people because we're living in Java. And well, the other thing is, if you want to work on performance and you just want to have an excuse to work on cool things, that's a fair, po fair point for a performance optimization too, I think. OK. Well, essentially, the answer is that it usually depends on, um, on what you want to work on and what you need to work on. There's one thing I actually want to repeat here. Um, we worked on a performance issue in Lucene um, in, a, in a software company called The Suggester. And we were really worried about a change because it made the query um, performance six, th we lost 6,000 queries per second. So we were optimizing the shit out of it until we realized that actually our benchmark was off by a factor of 10. So it's actually, we lost 6,000 queries per second. Yeah, fine. But it, the, the actual baseline was not 60,000 queries per second, but 600,000 queries per second. So one thing is like, you know, if you're 10 times slower than crazy fast, you're still crazy fast. You don't need to optimize there. Good. Um, I have gained a lot of experience with consulting and um, what I saw with a lot of people and a lot of other committers actually um, told a, lo a lot of other people that too, like Hosman told that on a couple of occasions that if you think you have a performance problem, make sure you actually have it or make sure you're actually knowing the component who has the performance problem. You know, if you, if you say indexing is slow, but you're still always running your benchmarks, including your database, and your database can't keep up with the interest rate of your index writer, then it's probably not the right thing to tune the scene at this point. So take things out of the picture, make sure you know what you need to tune, and then the optimizations we do and the APIs we offer in the scene can actually help you. Okay. 
Lucene 4 is um, almost an entire rewrite. There's um, a lot of APIs entirely changed. There's um, like the field API changed, all the, the ways how you iterate over documents, over terms. We, we really tried to make it more intuitive, to make it more flexible, more efficient, and um, this is what I want to show you today. I looked at the release notes, and I was like, this is gonna be great, I can talk for hours about this because it was like it was this list of 15 20 20 points and there were even like performance improvements over over 200 times faster queries were not even in the release notes so there was so many other features they're up there that that we haven't had space for this it actually turned out that it was a really challenge to wrap this into a talk and make sense out of a couple of things so i took those and i'm going to talk about those today not in that order but, um, and, and I have a couple of backup slides. If I would make it in time, then we can talk about other things too. But this is what I'm gonna talk about today. Concurrent flushing. Um, who uses Lucene, Solar, Elasticsearch, anything, and has ever encountered a situation where you index and suddenly the number of documents per second drops to zero? One, two, three, four, okay. Do you know why this happened? Flush, correct. So, um, in Lucene, until Lucene 3, this was roughly the model how the index writer worked, right? We had an index writer on top, and there was a classic abstraction called documents writer, and the documents writer assigned a threat state to an incoming threat. For a long time, this was actually limited to a max of six threat states. So firing index requests with 200 threats against Lucene didn't really buy you anything. Well, it, during, with these threats, we actually fill up little in-memory segments. And once we reach a certain threshold, a certain limit, we make a decision and say, OK, we're going to merge those, two, those, those segments in RAM into one big segment. And that's what we're going to write to disk. OK, this looks like a fairly reasonable model. The only problem is that in, during this time here, there's nothing happening over there. It's basically locked, right? The index writer is blocked. And what comes out of this is um, an interest rate graph like this, right? This is, this is uh, indexing um, all English Wikipedia pages, roughly 10 million of them. Um, with, um, with Lucene 3.6, it's actually Lucene 4 without the improvement, but the, the same model. And what happens here is that we index for roughly 20 seconds, and then we do nothing for 20 seconds, or it seems we're doing nothing. But we actually just single threaded in RAM, merging those segments. So there's a couple of prob problems here. Well, one problem is that during that time, your disk does nothing, right? And what's the slowest part? Well, it's obviously the disk. But your CPU goes crazy and blocks all the other threats. So you cannot keep on reading from the database, you can't index, you basically do nothing. In Lucene 4, we made this a little bit simpler. We threw away tons of glasses, we threw away lots of concurrent code, and made the whole thing from the documents writer down to the directory a single threaded piece of code. Document Swider is still almost the same as it used to be before from the abstraction point of view, but then, but then instead of like assigning the thread state and index into a RAM buffer and then merge it together, we just leave, on, leave each document writer per thread doing its own segment and we share it across threads. We still have the, um, the situation where at some point we run into the threshold, like there's too much RAM use, too many documents indexed. We need to write this to disk. But once we do this, we can do this per documents writer per thread. So in theory, you could have like five writers flushing at the same time without doing this in memory. And at the same time, another five writers indexing into memory again. So this looks much better, right? This is with document writer per thread. You get a constant uh, interest rate. And what we actually gained from this was roughly uh, a 300% performance improvement on highly concurrent hardware. 
But it actually turned out that you don't have, if you don't have highly concurrent hardware, it can he help even more. Because um, if your hardware is not that, uh, not that expensive, right, if you don't have too, too fast disks, the I.O. is the m even more slower part. And you want to make sure that your I.O. system is actually used constantly. You don't want to have this idling. You might wonder why you have these little spikes here. That's actually, I ran this benchmark before I realized that I should not read the source from the same hard disk. Because sometimes the disk was not able to keep up like reading and writing at the same time. Once I removed this, I had like this straight line of, of document throughputs, which helped a lot. These are our benchmarks. This is um, like in May, I think, we committed uh, concurrent flushing and went up from 100 uh, gigabytes an hour up to 200 gigabytes an hour, roughly. But then we realized, well, we had this limit of six threads. So we raised it to 20 and actually reduced the RAM buffer. So we're using less RAM, but more threads. And we ended up with roughly 300% of the, of the throughput we had before. I mean, there's, some, there's still some stuff going on up there. It's all these, if you want to look at this, there's the link. Um, then, and when you hover over those, you get the explanation what we changed. But those are not related to document writer per thread. So why do I tell you this? Well, one thing, I want to, to let you know what we changed so you understand it better. But on the other hand, if, you're, if you have a lot of knowledge how to tune the scene 36, the index writer with RAM buffer, this has changed. Like increasing the memory is not going to give you more performance. So if you upgrade to Lucene, you should actually look at your RAM buffers and see if it still makes sense to have such a big RAM buffer. Because what you basically want is that as soon one document writer per thread stopped flushing, you want to start the next one immediately. So your I.O. system is consistently used. But at the same time, you need to be really, really careful. Um, I had this situation a couple of times where SSH wasn't responding anymore because the, the machine was so busy with writing all the time that um, you, it couldn't do anything else. So you can also hammer your machine that you can't serve search requests. You need to be careful here, right? Um, especially when you do real-time search. It might make sense even if you do real-time search to restrict your indexing threats for real-time to only one threat to make sure you're not killing your search performance because this is absolutely optimized for I.O. utilization. So you need to be, be a little bit careful. You can um, set the maximum number of documents writer per thread so that uh, if you really just want to have one and you want to prevent this entirely, then you can set it to one and then you'll be fine. Can you tell uh, what triggers so the flush is triggered by two factors. One is max buffer docs. That is what we had before. A maximum number of documents in memory. It's a global setting. All the, num all the document writers per thread accumulated is the number of documents we're going to check. No, we will pick the largest. So I, that's why I said, in theory, you could have all them flushing at the same time. So if your system is, is pretty slow, you could run into the situation where you're still flushing the last document writer per thread, and, but taking the next one out of the loop, swap a new one in, keep on indexing, and flush that out. Right? So that you, your in-memory um, RAM consumption grows over the maximum. Um, what we do in that case, if you really have super, super slow disks and you have basically the double of the RAM in flushing memory and in active memory, then we're going to stall the indexing threads. Then indexing threads are not going to add any documents anymore. So there's a security limit in there. This change also released the 2,000, uh, the 2 gigabyte um, RAM limit in Lucene. Um, I don't think it's very important because the less RAM is better here. So, but you could, your, could give your machine um, as much <coughs> RAM buffer as you want. If you want to keep everything in memory, fair, you can do it. If it's worthwhile, I don't know. Um, we had somebody on the mailing list. They had super, super expensive hardware, like a couple of those uh, Fusion I.O. drives. And they were actually figuring out there's some, some bottlenecks in there in this stalling code. 
that keeps keeps doc, keeps uh, threats um, from adding too much documents while you flushing. Um, but uh, even when I remove it on on reasonable production hardware, I don't see any differences. So for I would say for 90, 98% of the users, this, is, this should work pretty well. Did that answer your question? OK. All right, next thing, doc values. Um, doc values, uh, anybody heard about this? Yay, perfect. OK, cool. Who knows field cache? Very good. How does field cache work? So this is this is basically how the scene works on the lowest level. We have nothing else than a sorted term dictionary, some statistics, and the number and the document IDs where the terms are stored in. So when you open a field cache, like for sorting or in some cases for faceting, you need to build those field caches. You need to build the field caches from your index terms. And how this works is, once the first time the field cache is pulled, you need it, we're going to walk the entire term dictionary from top to bottom, read the term, parse it, read the posting list, put the values into the relevant documents in a slot in an array. OK? Really straightforward. This can take a long time, especially if you have a lot of documents, if you have a lot of field caches. And if you do this in a real-time situation where you actually want to have your, your reopens to be pretty fast, this can be a major bottleneck. Well, on the one hand, it's a bottleneck. On the other hand, why don't we just store it in that way? Right? It's like when you know ahead of time you want to facet on it or you want to sort on it or you want to do, I don't know, geo-filtering, you want to do boosting, you store some kind of page rank in there, we can store it like this already. So this is why, um, why doc values came into the picture. Again, back to the uninverting. Why is this a problem? It's CPU and I.O. heavy. You need to think about it, right? You need to go through all the terms in this field, and this can be a lot. Um, you, you need to go and do like unnecessary type conversions. Um, the fields are sorted even if they don't need it to be. So during indexing, you do an additional work. Stuff is more complex. Um, you potentially create a lot of garbage. So there's a lot of things where you can actually save resources if you know ahead of time that you want to do this. So the solution to this is extremely simple. Instead of doing the um, term to document index, if you don't want to search on it, we're just going to store it in a column stride fashion. So we have a, a, a very dense storage solution now called doc, doc values, where you can assign one value per document and per field. It's not multi-valued at this point, and that might be a problem for some people, but that's just a limitation. OK, what are we going to do with this, and what are we going to save? Well, on the one hand, we don't, un we don't uninvert. We have a very compact representation in memory. Um, we pre-built this representation, so there's literally no like runtime cost except of loading things from disk into memory. Um, loading is much faster, um, obviously, because you don't need to go and iterate of all the terms and parse them um, and, and then put it, put it into an array or create all the objects. Um, it's all, also strongly typed. You can say, OK, I want to have stored as an integer. Um, you have all sorts of. You have integer 8-bit, integer 16-bit, integer 32-bit, 64. You have float 32, float 64. Um, you have uh, byte variants where you can store byte arrays. You can say, OK, I want to, Lucene should deduplicate the bytes if I share a lot of values. Um, you can have them pre-sorted if you need them. For sorting, this is helpful. Um, but it, it all depends on you, on your use case. We're not going to do any extra work if we don't need to. The really nice thing about this is if you can pay the price of not loading this into memory, you can also access it on disk directly. This might make sense for some people. I, I had a customer that had 150 fields where they wanted to do sort on, um, depending on what the user inputs. Right? I, I couldn't even think about an interface where you can select out of 150 fields to sort on, but obviously it was useful for them. 
but they were obviously running out of memory all the time. So you could do uh, more intelligent things here where you load uh, fields into memory that are sorted on very, very frequently, but fields that are not sorted on very frequently, you just keep them on memory and then people pay the price of having a slightly slower query. Um, doc values don't prevent you from indexing the field or using stored fields, all this kind of, this is, this is completely next to all the other features. Do you have any questions about this? Use cases. Oh, it can be used instead of stored fields. Uh, I'm just saying it, it doesn't prevent you from also storing it, right? Uh, it can have a different value as the stored field. Can we update them? Not yet. <laughs> uh, why? Find me later. I give you the entire story. It's it, it it seems easy once you get into merging, and delete docs and concurrency, and this is tricky. Um, but um, I I I I promise at some point they will be updatable. I'm not gonna make any promises when. Um, no, this is definitely on the list, um, and this is way more reasonable than having updatable uh, indexed fields. Like um, when you when you think of updatable indexed fields, you need to be really careful about that you're not destroying your statistics, like inverse document frequency, and term frequency, um, and all these kind of things. And you need to update basically a sorted index, and uh, that can be can be really tricky. But um, I totally agree that if we would make those doc values updatable, we probably solve like 70% of the use cases of updatable fields, where you have like some kind of scoring value um, you want to update frequently. Um, yeah, this is def this is definitely something that uh, would be a major contribution. Patches welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, what can you use this for? Well, there's a lot of use cases. Uh, we actually also use it for scoring, like the norms, the normalization values um, are stored as document, uh, as, as doc values. Um, you could use it for sorting. You could also use it for grouping. I think more time we have a patch that uses it for grouping, do we? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, faceting, I don't think there's anything implemented yet, even in Solar, Yannick, no, nothing. Um, yeah, or you can also do like, th this is an idea I just had last time when, I, when uh, the last, the Euro, uh, the last um, Lucene revolution, that if you have massive filters, you actually can pre-compute, like um, w where you just say in a certain field, this, this document belongs to the filter, and it belongs to the set, and this doesn't belong to the set. You could just use a variable int uh, as doc values, with values one and zero, and that'll be encoded as bits. And those bits you could pass directly to, to the filter mechanism of Lucene. So you can basically, without executing the filter on any segment, just preload it. If you have those really massive filters, um, that can be useful too. Um, GeoSearch, obviously, you can store longitude and latitude values in here. OK, flexible scoring. Um, that is probably for, for people who are interested in scoring models and um, g getting more relevance, optimizing, optimizing your search engines. This is probably something that is very interesting for you. Because until Lucene 4, uh, we were basically bound to TF-IDF. I think the first talk was mainly about TF-IDF. Um, this is not true anymore. So we thanks to Google Summer of Code and uh, a couple of committers have really spent a lot of time on this. Um, we, we actually try to remove those limitations here. So you did the big, one of the biggest limitations obviously was TF-IDF. You couldn't use anything else without making like a whole clone of the code base. Um, and the other thing which was preventing this was that we haven't had enough index statistics to implement other scoring models. So that this was something that needed to be fixed too. And that was really hard to add yourself. Okay, um, so basically what you can do now in Lucene is each field can, his own, can have its own similarity. Similarity is just an abstraction for a scoring model. And the, the similarity is actually not the part that is, that is actually consulted for the document to score from the scorer, 
what we in Lucene call a scorer, we have the, the, the similarity returns a, uh, an, an, an exact doc scorer or a sloppy doc scorer to the actual execution of the query. So that everything, all the statistics, all the calculations that are entirely encapsulated and hidden in the similarity. So you could just provide your own and implement your own awesome scoring model. I mean, I don't think a lot of people will do this, but we have a couple of defaults here. And you can, you can um, make this work much better with your use case. We also have uh, a bunch of new um, index statistics, like the total term frequency, sum of document frequencies, um, doc counts per field, how many documents do you have a value in this field, um, sum of total term frequency, so that uh, if you have like a mixed index, it would probably make more sense to use the doc count per field um, for IDF calculation at this point, rather than like your, the global number of documents. Right, your global number of documents could be 15 times higher than this, and then your statistics get a little bit different. They're probably going to have the same proportions, but in the, for this it would make sense. You can also estimate the uh, average document length with these statistics. That helps for scoring models like BM25, and this is also how it's implemented. We also changed norms here to actually use doc values. That means that a norm value in the scene is not a single byte anymore. In previous versions, we had a single byte, and we, we tried to squash and squeeze the, the document boost and the, the length normalization value into this eight bits. Right? And a lot of people are wondering, like, I boost, I boost by 100, and what comes out of it is like 75? What's going on? Right? Well, you lose precision at this point. Once you try to put a 32-bit value into an 8-bit value, you're obviously going to pay the price for it. If you need exact statistics, you can do this now. And you can actually do it without forking the entire code base. It's actually very straightforward. You can um, write whatever you want into the norms field. You can do a byte array, or you can do a 32-bit integer, or a double, and use it, this at scoring time. So what do we have by default? Um, we have a copy BM25, um, certain language models, information-based uh, models, divergent from randomness, and um, if I recall correctly, there's yet another coming. Um, the first one, which needs more than two values in the, in the norms table. Um, the first time we actually can use this, um, doc values as norms. But yeah, um, if you, especially if you, if you work with um, documents that are really short, Okabi BM25 might be slightly slower execution-wise, but the results look much better. So this is certainly something you might want to consider if you're moving to Lucene 4 to actually get a little bit into what we can offer scoring-wise and not just blindly go and use BM25. Uh, T TFIDF, sorry. Any questions about this? It's a, it's a certain scoring model implementation. Um, I'm not going to go into details what they exactly do, um, but they're useful for, um, for certain, for certain um, use cases. You could probably ask Stefan, he's sitting up there, um, how, how these kind of things work. Um, he, th this is what he got his PhD for, <laughs> all this kind of stuff, so he's the right person to talk to. Okay. Codex. Everybody talks about codex, flexible indexing. Um, that, is, that is the big thing with Lucene 4. We were talking about this for years. Um, now it's actually released. And hey, it's actually the first conference where it's released. I think I did the first Lucene 4 talk in early 2011. And when people ask me, when is it released? I was always saying, like, in a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Uh, it was probably 2010. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I feel kind of embarrassed at this point. Anyway, it's there now. That's good. Okay. Lucene 3.6. We had one index format. That was it. Right? Um, Lucene was writing and stuff to disk. That was sufficient for the most people. Um, and I think it would still be sufficient for the most people. But what it really enabled us to do was to cons consistently add new features specialized for certain use cases. So we came from this, right? Changing the file format needed 
extreme knowledge into Lucene, and there were probably like a handful of people uh, within the committer base and the, and the contributor space that could do that. Um, even just adding a small feature like omitting norms, um, uh, omitting term <coughs> frequencies and positions um, was a massive patch and took a long time to implement. And we wanted to be able to actually go around all these limitations and say, hey, we have a new idea for a file format, why don't we just try it? And don't go and change all the code and once we commit it, we, don't ha we lost all the other file formats. So we introduced the codec layer. And that codec layer um, <clears throat> allows you basically to decide how things are encoded on disk. Right? This is a common interface on top of um, what we call the directory, um, the, the file system abstraction that allows you to, to implement a certain interface um, where you get past all the terms, all the documents, all the positions of the documents, and it's up to you how to write it to disk. It's fully customizable. It, it, it might sound like, I'm never going to do this, this is going to be tough shit. Yeah, it is, but if you, if you well, on the one hand, uh, a researcher, you really want to do this and want to wanna play around with different encodings, this is awesome. Um, if, you, if you have a really big index and a very special use case, this can buy you a lot of performance if you want to go down this level. Um, but even more important for like 80% of the users is that once we decide or see, hey, we can improve something for all of you, we can actually go ahead and do it without breaking your index format. Because the Lucene 4 codec layer allows you to specify a codec per field. And even, even segments that, uh, have, that have been written with a previous Lucene version can still be read with, um, the, with the codec implementation that, the, that was used for writing, right? But if you write new segments, you get the new improved um, standard codec, I want to, want to call it, and you can just move on from one version to another without having trouble over index compatibility. This actually enables um, a lot of innovation, and this is what, what is really great about this. I mean, next to it, it it's, it's totally amazing that you can uh, write your own postings, term dictionaries, doc values, norms, whatever you want, um, that you can actually do that. Um, I personally don't know any other database-like library that allows you to write your own file format. Okay, um, so, yeah, what does this buy us? Well, um, however, you cr if, you're, if your idea is totally crazy, you can try it out. Right. Um, if if it if it works out, cool. If you wanna if you wanna write stuff as a B tree instead of an FST, what we do right now. If you wanna use Bloom filters because this is very good for your use case, or we wanna put everything in memory, um, we allow you to do this. For the most of those things, we already have implementations, so you can swap it in at runtime um, to your existing Lucene ap um, application when you use Lucene four. Um, but it, it doesn't prevent you from really improving or specializing Lucene for exactly your use case. So, what do we have? <laughs> well, um, we have uh, the, the pulsing postings format. We divided this into the top level class called codec, and then we have a postings format, a stored field format, a norms format, doc values format. So that each of those components where we write at index time, you can plug in and plug out. And you don't want to write the entire thing new, you just want to write this little posting format part, you can do that, you can reuse the other components. For postings formats, um, the, pu the pulsing one is something that is helpful if you have um, just a couple of documents per term. Right? For terms that are very low frequent, like one, three, four, five terms, we inline the posting list into the term dictionary so we don't need to do a second seek from an offset into the, into the postings format. Um, that might help with performance when you do primary key lookups, for instance. And it's relatively cheap memory-wise. Bloom postings format uses a Bloom filter. 
Um, that can help a lot with NRT when you do deletes. A lot of deletes require a lot of lookups in the scene, ID lookups, and that can help you a lot um, when you are applying deletes um, during indexing performance-wise because it, you know, the Bloom filter can definitely tell you if it's, or with a certain probability tell you if it's in there, but um, it's, it's never going to say it's not in there if it's actually in there. So no false positives. Um, Block postings format is uh, the new standard in, in Lucene 4.1. Um, it basically encodes um, term frequencies, document IDs, uh, document positions as blocks on disk and um, decodes those blocks on the fly instead of what we have done before as variable ints. And that gives you a lot of performance improvements, especially for, for conjunction queries. Is that right, Adrian? Yeah? Okay. Um, the other thing here is that in Lucene 3, if you index positions, you had to pay to pay the uh, index and uh, positions and payloads. You had to pay the price for the payloads if you use them or not, right? So that they were actually really costly. You had to read them. And with block postings, they are kind of separate. So we, if you don't need the payloads at all then uh, we don't even decode them. So you save a lot of time uh, for things you don't need to use. Okay. Block term tree is our new default uh, term dictionary. Um, there is um, a, a dramatic RAM reduction with this uh, block term tree. If somebody is, cur is curious, it's a mixture of a finite state machine with uh, a burst try. So if that means something to anybody. Uh, it's a very interesting implementation. Code is super hard to read. Uh, if somebody wants to document it, it's super welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, the, we, we got massive lookup improvement, uh, sp lookup speed improvements with this. It takes a lot, a lot less memory. It's very compact in RAM, super fast reading from disk. Um, so your index opening times are reduced dramatically with this too. Then we also have the super slow slash simple text postings format. So if you're just curious and want to know how this works, you can also write it as plain text, but don't use this in production, right? This is, this is intentionally super crappy. The, the code is super crappy intentionally because we use this for testing um, that, we, that the rest of our infrastructure can actually also deal with very RAM intensive co codecs and those, all those kind of things. Um, we also have a memory postings format. Somebody asked me this morning when this um, becomes important. I usually recommend it only to use it if you, if you use this for primary keys. Because the memory postings does not only load the term dictionary in memory, it also loads all the payloads, all the, all the positions, all the IDs into memory, and, and codes that in a certain structure. For key value lookups, we get up to a million lookups a second on a single box, right? This is super fast, but it's probably not the right thing for full text searches on large fields. Well, you will realize that quickly. <laughs> okay, we don't, have, we don't just have postings here. Um, we also have a new compressed fields format. Thanks to Adrian, so if you have questions about this, he's sitting up there and he's happy to answer your questions. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of um, performance improvements coming together with the compressed stored fields because um, what this essentially means is that we're using a, a tremendous amount of less disk space and that means it fits much better in the file system cache and um, since we don't have to load that much stuff from the disk and your disk is so slow, even the, the overhead of the decompressing of the data is so tiny that you get a, a massive speed improvement even over, over that you have less disk space. We're actually thinking about making it the default. Did we commit it already? Yeah. Yeah. So it's the default in 4.1. Yeah, and everything else you can also write through codecs. Like you can write your own term, term vectors if anybody wants to do this. Um, delete the documents or segment level information. It's, it's up to you or it's basically mostly for us to be able to change things over, over versions. So, hey, I want to encourage you if you have a good idea for compressions or making things faster or making things more efficient, um, 
please come up on the mailing list, tell us, even if it's not going to work out, it's always good fun. Wrapping up, um, well, if I had more time, <laughs> I would talk about uh, filters, where can, you can uh, get improvements up to 500% in execution time. Automaton queries, um, our famous fuzzy query, um, new fuzzy query implementations. Um, we now have terms offsets in the index, which uh, allows us to, in the, in the future, have really efficient highlighting implementations. Highlighting is one of my biggest pain points in Lucene. It's actually really slow. Um, and that will hopefully get better in the, in the near future. Um, we have uh, things like uh, new spell checkers and query suggestors. I highly encourage you to look at the suggestors. You can do really, really nice things. And if you want to see something, I can show you some implementations of um, um, something we call a fuzzy suggester, which <laughs> delivers you uh, query suggestions and spell checks them on the fly and re-ranks them. It's kind of a really nice thing, um, cool user experience. Um, yeah, and many, many more things. I have a couple of backup slides, but no time, and there's beer. Thank you. <laughs>